You're listening to the Option Alpha podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again at OptionAlpha.com working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered online and in iTunes because it's based on one thing and one thing only and that's helping you guys make smarter trades. So again, thanks so much for tuning in today. On today's show, we've got a very special guest in here with us. And again, like I say, every time that we bring someone on, I'm not just bringing people on here to fill up airtime and to fill up slots on the show. I want to bring people in here that will add value to your trading. And so in today's example and today's case, we're going to be bringing in here Mark Sebastian in a second. He is a former floor trader and hedge fund manager, also is the founder of OptionPit.com, which I'm sure you've heard of. If you haven't, you can go on over there and check it out. We'll have it all linked up in the show notes. But the reason that I brought in Mark here is because he's specialized. I mean, not only does this guy have a lot of experience in trading, I mean, he's been trading for decades now and has a lot of experience um, in just the investing and options world, but he's got specialized experience with these volatility products. So things like the VIX and the VIX futures and VXX and UVXY. And so for me, this is a great opportunity to kind of expand what we're doing here at Option Alpha and bring somebody in that has a little bit more understanding of intimately how these products work and how you can use them a little bit better in your own trading. And truth be told, it's a little bit selfish for me because I had a lot of questions for Mark on you know, just little tweaks and strategy and stuff like that, which you'll hear towards the end of the episode as we talk about you know how I was trading VXX and he offered a different suggestion. And that's great because that's good for me. Like I learn and grow out of doing these as well. Now, the reason that I also brought him on is because he also just released a very short but very powerful little mini ebook called The Fear Gauge. And we'll link up to this here in the show notes page. But like I said, it's a pretty short read. It's about eight or 10 pages or so, but very, very specific on how the VIX is structured, what the history of it is, how you can look at the futures term structure, how you can really trade some of these ETNs around the VIX and volatility. So that's your VXX and UVXY. So really cool, really short read. Again, we'll have a link up in the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 68. Again, that's just the number 68, optionalpha.com slash show 68. So I encourage you to really Really dig in here and listen in. Even though it's Halloween, I think it's really fitting that we release this show today because most people really look at the VIX as the fear gauge. So look, I mean, planning this thing out, I kind of had this like penciled in on my calendar and I'm glad that we hadn't a chance to interview Mark. So without further ado, let's get Mark on the phone and get started. All right. So today we've got Mark Sebastian on the phone here from Option Pit. Mark, thank you so much for joining us here today. Yeah, I appreciate you inviting me on the show. It's happy to be here. Awesome, man. So why don't you give everyone a little bit of uh, background on you, kind of tell your story about how you got started, what you used to do before, and maybe a little bit about where you are now. Yeah. So I was a floor trader for about a decade on uh, the Amex first, which is in New York, and then the CBOE here in Chicago. Then after that, I started Option Pit. We are an education and consulting firm. And what we kind of try and do is bring the professional approach to trading and risk management out into the retail space. And then on the consulting side, I'll work with hedge funds and money managers and help them implement stress test and optimize option strategies. And then when I'm not doing that, I run a hedge fund called Carmeline Capital that almost exclusively trades VIX and S&P 500 options. Awesome, man. And so how did you, because I think people need to hear a little bit about it or they might be interested in it, but how did you get into trading kind of before that? So like what was your progression maybe out of college or high school or whatever? Yeah, you know, what was interesting was I was at uh, Villanova University out in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and I was enjoying school and with all intent of doing investment banking or something like that, I was doing really well. And I had a finance professor aside, one of my favorite one, and he pulled me aside and he said, hey, I'm starting this derivatives class. It's going to be pretty hard. And so uh, you should take it. <laughs> I was like, excuse me, you're going to my senior year and you want me to take a hard class. Right. Uh, right. Well, I did and I loved it. And then I interviewed with Group One Trading. They hired me out of college into their trader training program in New York. I spent a year clerking and getting taught at night. And then after about a year, they put me on a pageant and uh, on the Amex. 
Awesome. And I think that's good. And that's cool. And then, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that. So that's, you know, I think that that's interesting for people to hear. So, all right. So like I said, in the intro, what we're going to try to do here is just kind of really dive into VIX and uh, volatility options and and how, you know, people can understand them and trade them, which obviously is your specialty. So I love having you on. And so that people know too, I'll be linking this up in the show notes at show 68 on the website, but you put together a great little ebook on the VIX, which is called the fear gauge. That's the ebook. And of course people can go there and download it for free. So first thing that we should talk about is let's just talk a little bit about the history of the VIX because Although it was released in 93, it's gone through some changes as far as how it's priced and what it looks at. So can we, let's kind of walk through like the history, why they did it, and like where it has progressed over time. Yeah, so the VIX started out as a volatility-based index like it is now. And the guy that invented it, Whaley, what he was trying to do was, was get a gauge of kind of an index of where volatility was on the most active index contract at the time, which was actually the S&P 100 or the OEX. And the initial calculation used about eight strikes to come up with a price. And it was very kind of centered at the money. Then as time passed, the OEX traders ruined the product. And so people stopped trading OEX and moved on to SPX. And it's another story for another time. But the OEX at one point was far busier than the S&P 500 options. And the market makers literally abused the customers so bad that the customers ditched the product and went to S&P. So then the SPX product, they were, you know, they were looking at it and Goldman Sachs got involved and said, you know, what we want is something that looks a little bit more like a variant swap, gives us a better price of a variant swap. For those of you who don't know what a variant swap, variance is really what a lot of the upstairs banks use to trade. And it's similar to volatility, except for there's a squaring effect. So if Kirk and I were to trade a variant swap with, let's say, a million Vega at a 17 strike, if Kirk buys the 17 strike for me and I sell him a million Vega, if over the calculation period, volatility is 18%, I owe Kirk a million dollars. If volatility is 19%, I owe him th- that those two points squared. So I actually owe you $4 million. And so, you know, if volatility, let's say a 2008 scenario, scenario begins where at the beginning of the year, variant swaps were trading for around 16 and variant, the year-long variance was around 28. So that was on a million Vega, I would have owed you $144 million. Gotcha. Goldman Sachs, big trader, they wanted an index that kind of looked at, kind of priced itself similarly to an S&P variance swap. And that was where they came up with the VIX calculation. Then after they came out with this the current, that VIX calculation, they began listing VIX futures and they began listing VIX options. VIX futures are essentially a, uh, a forward contract on VIX and you know going further out. So a lot of people get confused when they see VIX futures and when they trade VIX option because they don't track the cash index that all that well. Right. And the reason is is that they're a forward contract based on VIX. They're not an actual contract on the VIX index. Okay, so let's oh. let's actually get into that because I think that that's a a key point. You get into that a little bit further back. I think on like pick page uh, seven and eight in your ebook. But what you do talk about is just that that understanding of just how the VIX futures and and then those options are obviously priced and how those different curves actually you know can shift and adjust over time. So you want to cover that a little bit because I think it's important for people to understand when they look at this differential. Yeah. So I think the big thing to to let's start with kind of the concept of volatility. And what is like the one rule that I that holds the volatility universe together, Kirk? Volatility is what? Oh, I don't know. What it, what, what would it be? Just that volatility is always mean changing. Revert. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Why you say mean reverting? Yeah, pops higher, drops lower. Mean reverting. Yeah, but it, it, yeah, volatility more unlike just about everything is mean reverting. So if I buy, if Apple goes to two hundred or three hundred, it can stay there. Whereas if, if the implied volatility of Apple option goes to 100 or 200, it can't. It will have to go back toward that kind of 20 or 25 percent it normally stays at. So we're dealing with a product that has a natural tendency. The underlying has a tendency to mean revert. And then the contract, the VIX future, 
is a European style contract. So there's no early exercise on it. So when the VIX is really low, there's an expectation that VIX is going to revert higher. And when VIX is very high, there's an expectation that it's going to revert lower. So if I, if the VIX right now, as we're talking, VIX is exactly 13. So the contract, the regular October contract that expires in two weeks, about two weeks, is actually trading 15.10. And so the expectation is VIX is low and is likely to revert higher. So the VIX future, that is two weeks from now, is trading at a premium. That is called a contango. In scenarios where we've seen volatility really stressed, let's say coming out of Brexit, and the VIX was in the 20s and 30s, the expectation is it's going to move lower. And thus, that VIX future does not track the VIX contract. So, for instance, in August of 2015, when the VIX printed, what, 53? The highest that VIX future actually traded on the day was about 28. Right. Uh, that is how high the expectation was for mean reversion. So the thing to recognize is that because there's no early exercise, it is going to follow but not track. Think of it as, oh, cracking a whip. You know, the, the, there's the, mo the sonic boom. The speed of the whip is at the very end. And the further you get toward where your hand is, the less movement there is in the actual whip. You know, I don't whip my hand that hard. And at the very end, it actually creates a breaking of the sound barrier. And that's really the how VIX and VIX futures function. Right. So I guess it would be safe to say if I let me just summarize it for people so they understand, because I think this is a key point, is that generally when VIX is high, the futures are going to trade at a discount because they know that eventually over a certain period of time, the VIX is going to come back down, mean reversion. And when VIX is low, then futures are going to trade at some sort of premium because they know over a given period of time, it may revert a little bit higher if it's relatively low. Right. And the closer you get to expiration, the, the more that premium dissipates. So... For instance, they have weekly VIX contracts now, and the, the October 12 that expires next week is 14 and a half. And then behind that, the November contract, which is behind October, is actually trading 1660. So as we move in, closer expiration, the closer you're going to track the VIX contract, and the further out we go, the slower, the, the lower the volatility of the contract and the greater it's going to deviate from the cash index. Yeah. And I think this is great too. And you've got a, a great little chart in the, uh, in the ebook going back from October in 2008. And you can basically like see out into the future for 240 days. And you mm -hmm. see that, you know, based on that time, which was one of the highest points, right? It wasn't, I think it was the highest point in the VIX that you actually took that, that screenshot of that day. But you, then you could see that the futures pricing 240 days out, assume that the VIX was down, you know, back below 30 or right around 30. So it already just naturally accounted for that, that time differential that we, you know, saw. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So here's the thing. So people are asking a lot of the time, and I think, I think that this is important, right? We have a lot of these different ETFs that are around here, these ETPs around the VIX. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do people need to know about these? Because it, it's highly active and a lot of people trade them. So like VXX, UVXY, all these ones. How should people really be looking at those and understand those? Because when you actually chart them, then they just continuously fall to the down, you know, to the right. And at least for VXX. And this is different because people say like, you know, how do I trade VIX versus VXX? And how, how do I make that differential or that distinction? All right. Well, you know, the thing to understand with VXX is VXX is a slave to the curve. Yep. And so you know who Sis King Sisyphus was from Greek mythology? No, I, I don't. I'm, I was really bad in history. I was good in math, but not, not good in so history. The story of the guy who thought he was smarter than Zeus, and so he had to roll a boulder up a hill, and then every night the, the boulder gotcha. rolls back down the hill. That's really kind of how VXX is structured. So what it does is – it's constantly trying to keep a duration of the VIX future at 30 days, Yeah. right? So on an intraday basis, so within the day, VXX is going to track a 30-day future beautifully. It does exactly what you expect. However, because of the rebalancing of the contract, because 
every day in order to keep that duration. Right now, VXX is carrying October and it's carrying November futures. Every day it has to sell out some of its October and buy some of its November. And so what I want you to think about is imagine that I bought in at 30 days to expiration when the November future is 30 days to expire, that VXX is entirely November future. OK, so it's 100 percent November futures and that November future it owns for a net average price of sixteen and a half dollars. Well, over the next 30 days, I am slowly selling off that position at a loss. So I'm selling my November futures that I bought for 1650. If VIX stays 13, I'm going to sell them at you know a little bit for 1640, 1630. You know, it half when we get to a couple of weeks away, we'll be where October is right now at about 15. So I'm taking a loss every day as the VIX future that I own meanders toward the VIX cash index. Now, there's this concept uh, that sometimes is called roll yield, and it that is a completely complete mischaracterization of kind of how VXX loses money. VXX loses money because it buys futures for a greater price than it ends up selling them out at. So if there is a steep contango, but the November future that I own for 1650 – I'm selling at 1660 and 1670. I'm not going to like suffer from roll yield problems. I'm not going to collect roll yield. It's really the process of that VIX future converging with VIX cash. So my friend Bill Luby of VIX and More Rights kind of puts it this way. On a daily basis, VIX is 100% driven by the movement in VIX futures. But on a week-to-week and month-to-month basis – VXX is entirely driven by the structure of the VIX curve. Mm-hmm. Yep. And what you say is that it's it's usually in contango about 80, 85% of the time, right? Yeah. And that's what drives it all the time. And so people don't understand that that I, – I guess that like it's like operating its own business as a loss because it's selling the front month, having to buy the back month all the time, and then it just yeah. continues to pull lower. Correct. And so – if you think that the VIX is going to make a quick move in the next couple of days, VXX can absolutely make sense. But using VXX as a long-term portfolio hedge or anything like that is a huge mistake. If you are looking to do portfolio hedging or things like that, I strongly encourage you to use directly in the VIX futures or VIX options over any of the ETPs. Gotcha. And so this also works kind of in the inverse too, right? With some of the ATPs that that basically track the inverse. Correct. You've got XIV that is a you know an inverse of VXX. However, what's interesting is being short VXX makes more money than being long XIV, and that's because XIV has a daily t- tracking component that can break. So one thing we know is I can short VXX and short XIV and make money. Nice. Even Wonderful. Though, even though they're they're inverses of each other. Yeah. Even though they're sp- supposed to be direct inverses of each other, because right. of that tracking component, you can take advantage of that differential. Right. Okay. Perfect. So let's actually that kind of brings us into a little bit of a segue because, you know, one thing I want to talk about is is hedging and and how people either should be using it or shouldn't be using it. One thing that you said in your book, and I think this is great, is that VIX explodes higher and then eases lower. And so that concept of just understanding just how quickly volatility can expand, but then mm-hmm. that it will contract on a slower pace means that not necessarily all the time do you have to, you know, buy a lot of contracts if you want to hedge because a couple contracts can, you know, generate a lot of hedge for your portfolio. One, yes. Two, the, the value I think of, of using VIX to hedge is this sticky strike concept. So right now the S and P is twenty one sixty. All right. And if I went out, where where was the S&P at the beginning of the year? Something like, oh, let, let me pull up a chart here. I was going to say, I can't pull up a chart because when I record, it like freezes my screen. So I'm just all on here. So, all right. So one year ago, let's just use one year ago. So one year ago, the it was October and the S&P was 2000. And now it's 2160. Whereas VIX... And this is the beauty of it. One year ago, VIX was, well, VIX was around 18 and right now it's around 13. But 
the the beauty of the of the trade is you know and and as early as last week it got to 18 got uh, as high as almost 19 right so the beauty of of vix is the s p can rally 100 points or 200 points and the vix might stay might stay 13 or 12 you know and whereas if i hedge s p by buying a put at the 2000 strike and the S&P runs away from my strike, well, guess what? I need to drop 160 points before my initial hedge starts working. So VIX allows for less rebalancing, and it does work in, in events where things explode. Now, one thing that's interesting is because people are starting to be aware of how crazy and mean reverting volatility can be, the VIX futures in that front month have had a – greater volatility on the way up and a greater volatility on the way down as of late as people have piled into this product. Uh, my friend Chris Cole says being a volatility shorter via VIX or VIX futures has become a little bit of a shoe shine boy trade. Yep. You know, you know, you know the old saying that yep. like when your shoe shine boy starts talking about stocks, it's the market's about to sell off. Well, there's definitely been an increase in volatility due to big banks and, and other groups figuring out that there's an edge in, in being short vol on these spikes. So in that case, and I, I totally agree because I think like even just a little while ago when, you know, VXX spiked up, I sold a bunch of calls, made some good money and we were out of them in five days. Right. And so mm. like that trade, right, is an easy one. And I agree with you. It's like a, not like a drop in the bucket, but I mean, that's been pretty consistent. So what is, what do you see happening then it's as what the, uh, what's that? <laughs> I said that will be really consistent until it isn't. Well, exactly. And that's what I'm saying is so what's going to happen in that scenario where the next time it pops up and say I sell a bunch of call options trying to take advantage of that, how would I, I guess, not make money in that case? Would Is it that the banks are just buying it up because they know, hey, there's a bunch of people shorting this and we're going to arbitrage this opportunity to you know buy yeah. this thing up? Well, one thing to be aware of is that pay attention to the VIX curve. And if the the case of VXX, let's say – if that front month VIX future trades over the second month VIX future, then the second month VIX future starts trading over the third month and the third month goes over the fourth. So if you see not just kind of the front two contracts, but kind of the whole curve flip, yep. that's usually a sign that we could have an extended increase in volatility. So if you look at kind of kind of the December through February time frame where volatility was consistently higher and consistently, you know, average the 50 day moving average of VIX went from about 1670 all the way to 22. So those are the periods of time. And during that period of time, if you look at VXX during that exact same period of time, VXX went from you know, a split adjusted now, yeah. like 70, 75, all the way up to 130 or 100 and yeah, 125. Yeah. So, so almost, almost a doubling in that price. Yeah. And, and when, when, so when you see the curve make a an extended move where more than two contracts go into a backwardation, that's a sign that Volatility may have some momentum to itself and may actually really cause some problems if you're trying to be short. Gotcha. And that's a that's a good sign to, to take that short call trade and flip it. Yep. And do it the other way. Yeah. Gotcha. And then or – well, I guess – and here's a question too. Or do you just make that trade a little bit longer out in duration? Uh, that's another option. I would actually – in a situation like that, if you think it's going to revert, I would actually look toward buying puts. Okay. So you buy the puts instead of sell the longer durated, uh, duration calls. Got it. It's likely to blow up in your face. Right. VXX can be a margin call nightmare Yeah. for, for traders because when it starts – when it goes into that big backwardation and it starts making money every day, it can just be a huge pain in the butt. Well, I mean just like you said, I mean it can you know practically 90% increase in price during that time period. That can cause a lot of issues if you've got too, too big of a position size or can't handle the margin, right? Fact. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. So we covered that and I think that's good. So as far as – but let's talk about this, I guess. As far as how people should really be looking at volatility and using volatility as a hedge, let's mm -hmm. let's start with this one. What should they use as their volatility product of choice? In most cases, should it be it should be the VIX? Is that what you're saying? It should be the VIX. 
And how should they be using it, right? Should they be buying just simply buying at the money futures? Should they be buying, you know, three month out? Is it, does it depend on their time frame? How do they so really look at that? Two ways to do it are, you know, the way I like it with the futures is what I call a crisis alpha approach. And my friends, Mike and Matt Thompson at Typhon, we do some close work together looking at this. And one of the things we know, there's two different ways to hedge. Do you need to hedge against, are you the type of person that wants to hedge against the nuclear war of September 11th? Right. Or are you the type of person that wants to hedge against a true systemic problem? So the, the thing that we know is that if you look at every major event in history, they, they're not in a vacuum. Even in October of 1987, volatility was moving way higher the previous week. So my general approach is take a look at, keep an eye on those VIX futures. And when we see that scenario where we kind of see the front month over the back, over the back month and the back for the third month, engage in a long futures approach or go long VXX or something like that and use that as a hedge. That's the way I would use the futures. Now, if you're a person that wants a static hedge, that wants something on, use VIX options. Go The way I usually write it up for institutions is I'm looking at, a, at options 45 to 75 days to expiration, and I'm doing what's called a back spread. So, for instance, this week I wrote up for the brokers that I, I do some, you know, a, a weekly vol report for Tullet Prebom, which is a big institutional options broker. And the trade, uh, the hedge trade I wrote up was by selling the 19 calls in November, buying two of the 24 calls in November, paying about 20 or 30 cents. And then I suggested selling a, a weekly put at like the 13 or the 12 and a half strike to finance part of it. Gotcha. So and, and that's so the way I usually structure those hedges is, is what's called a back spread. Yeah. And I think that's good because we've talked about this on the podcast before. And what you're trying to do in this case, and correct me if I'm wrong, unless maybe I'm assuming wrong, but obviously selling the put to hedge or to reduce the cost of it, that's part of it. And then, but by doing the back spread, all you're really doing is protecting like the long tail end of it, right? I mean, obviously if it lands in between, then you're out a little bit on that money, but you know, at expiration, but you're trying to protect the long end of, of, you know, maybe a big volatility move. And that, that hedge is a pretty good job all the way through November. So the November trade will do a good job of hedging a portfolio until about November non-farm payrolls. Then that trade typically needs to be rolled out either out to December or January. So if I had an October trade on, I would have already rolled it just because of how late non-farm payrolls were this month. But generally speaking, you know, if non-farm payrolls are on a normal day, like the second or the third, like you expect them to be, th that back spread will do an excellent job of, of hedging off risk. And is that what you're trying to do? Or I guess, is that what most people try to do is tie that to those major market events, Fed announcement, non-farm payrolls, elections could be another one. Actually, a question that Eli had in our membership group, I'm sorry, Lenny had was how do you know you hedge or how do these volatility products behave heading into elections and then maybe even right after elections? And is there any opportunity there or at least you know knowing what, what, they, what they do and how they behave? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, this election is a little unique. Normally, elections are not that big of a deal. You will see volatility move around if – so, for instance, when in 2012, when Romney got ahead in the polls for a little bit, after his good debate, market had a nice rally, volatility dropped. But it's not like when Obama won, volatility increased. And we're in a similar situation. Markets in general want Hillary Clinton to win. Yep. That's the way they're trading. I'm not taking it from a person, you know, personally, I don't care, but just the way the market's interpreted, we, if you look at the S&P 500, when Hillary beat, you know, clearly had a better debate than Donald Trump, futures rallied 10 handles. Yeah, it, it was I'll in the middle of the night. Yeah, exactly. In the middle of the night, it was all, and then the next day that dissipated as those guys realized that the people voting for Donald Trump are not the same guys that are buying S&P 500 futures at 11 o'clock at night. Right. <laughs> I mean, but, I was watching, I, I, it was funny because I was watching the same thing too. And I'm like, wow, if this is like a barometer of what the market thinks about Hillary, I mean, like, you know, it was off to the races. Yeah, you're right. The, the idea that she is going to be tough on Wall Street is la laughable. Yeah. So the one thing I think that markets do believe is that both administrations are going to be more lax on Wall Street than the current uh, Wall Street trading hedge funds than the current administration has been. 
Yeah. And yeah. maybe that's why they're trading at that. So, okay. So let's get into a couple questions here. I would fade any volatility pop around elections. Yeah. The president doesn't in terms of where the markets go. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. So let's get into some more questions because we did have some people in our Pro Delete mm-hmm. program submit some questions. So I'll start here. So Eli said, does volatility make a big move after being low for a long period? And I think the point that he was trying to make in this question is, is I mean, we've been through a period of generally really low volatility. So and as far as you guys know and research that you're, you've done obviously on your end, is there a point at which we say, hey, look, this is too long of a low period of volatility and we buy it because, you know, again, it's mean reverting and there's going to be a, you know, a pop in volatility or do we truly just wait until we see, you know, those VIX futures contracts start to, you know, basically reprice the front over yeah. the back, et cetera? The latter. Volatility correlates to itself far better than, than stock price does. And so when vol is low, it can stay low longer than you think, go lower than you can imagine. And the same thing on the rally. So what you have to really look for is kind of changes. So what I'm looking, what I'm really looking for at least a small near term pop, typically what I'll watch is, you know, I'm not going to look at the VIX on its own, but what I'll do is I'll look for several days of the S&P 500 rallying and VIX either rallying or not selling off with it. That to me is usually a sign that, you know, obviously you have to you have to take into account that we've got non-farm payroll. So, yep. you know, if the S&P rally is 30 bucks, but we're going to non-farm payroll Friday, you know, you have to take that into consideration. But if we're in the middle of the month and there's nothing major going on and the S&P has moved up 25 handles and VIX has gone from 13 to 1310 or 1320, that's a sign of traders buying a little bit of protection on the way up. And that could be a sign of a near-term reversal. I do use that as an indicator of a trading indicator for, you know, a reversal one way or the other. Gotcha. Okay, good. So next question was from Sam. He said, uh, most of the math I see involved in options pricing and probability calculations seems to involve a normal distributions, but obviously the VIX seems to be a little bit more skewed in distribution. So he said, is there any way to really take advantage of this, this differential or skew? And so I guess what he's really trying to talk about is kind of the structure and the term, you know, the curve of the VIX. Yeah, the VIX. there's all sorts, there are all sorts of term structure trades. You know, an interesting trade today. This is a trade I did in my fund today, just for as an example. So right now you've got the VIX cash index at 1293. You've got the VIX future at 1510. I bought the October 14 puts for 30 cents. I'm thinking about buying more of them right now as we're talking. And so think about this. I bought a 14 put for 30 cents and the VIX is 1295. So if the VIX does nothing or rallies as much as 75 cents, I will do break even or better by expiration. And so all I'm, you know, those are the type of plays I'm doing, actually mean reversion type plays, plays on volatility converging to itself. Gotcha. So those are the type of, of, of plays. And they are, there is a, stati- a significant statistical edge in those type of plays. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. And I think that's exactly what he's trying to do is get an example. So I appreciate that. Justin said in the forum, he said, I thought this quote was perfect. He said, VXX is a dangerous chimeric creature. It's structured like a bond, trades like a stock, falls of VIX futures and decays like an option. He said, given this quote and financial instruments of this type, how can option sellers, option traders basically profit consistently from trading VXX? Or I guess what I would add to this and kind of expanding on this is, do you even trade it on a consistent basis or do you wait for certain opportunities? I get from an option seller standpoint, I think with an, with VXX understanding how it's structured and especially UVXY, there's more edge on owning puts that are out of the money than selling calls. And I know people love being option sellers, but you know, this is a product where because of the natural drift, maybe makes sense to go from that, that direction. Now, that being said, you know, when you get a pop, I will flip around that one by two and buy one and, sh- and sell two. Mm-hmm. You can also use it to create put spreads, long debit spreads, if you will. Yep. Those are some things I will do with that. But um, I'm not a huge I'm not a huge proponent of call selling just because I think there's more money to be made in owning puts. 
Gotcha. Okay. And this is interesting too, because like I to be totally honest with everyone on the show and you obviously, like I prefer, and we've done, we bought some put debit spreads on it, but we also prefer to sell some calls. And so now I'll definitely look at, you know, doing a little bit more of ownership in the puts and just trading it that way. And I think, I think you're right. You know, if we look at that term structure, it might actually be a, a better trade or at least a little bit less risk in that position. So, okay, good. I think that's interesting. Ben said, and this is the uh, last question because some of the other ones we just got to, which were really simple. Ben asked, asked what prices are based on for each of the underlyings and also why anyone would trade options on them as a hedge when the futures are much cleaner with no market maker hassle with them. So why trade the options versus the futures? Because, uh, well, one, the futures have their own issues in terms of decay and things like that. The options allow you to kind of set where your your hedge is and the hedge can be cheaper. Yeah. So for instance, that backs for those back spreads that I talk about, those are a, that's a huge institutional trade and it is a far cheaper hedge than paying the huge contango cost of owning a November or an October future. And the other thing is if you trade directly in the futures and you're using it to hedge, there is a lot of role management that needs to be done. If you want to use the futures, they're great, but you're basically trading them like they, you know, they trade a lot like corn and, and wheat. You, there's management of that position that, that, that is pretty active yeah. and intense. So I think from a cost perspective, uh, it can be cheap. And if you have an understanding of VVIX, which is the vol of all, there can be some opportunities to put the, the vol of all behind your back on top of uh, taking advantage of, of relatively low priced volatility. Yeah, so good. So it's really cost, and I agree with you there. And then it's management. It's time of actually having to, you know, either manage the futures contracts versus, in your case, with the ratio. You know, you're not gonna, you're really not gonna do much management until you get further into the month, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have something. To, if especially if I sell puts against it, you know, I'm gonna have to manage the short puts that I sold. And if VIX makes a strong move, I'm gonna have to be aware of it, and then be aware that I need to roll in about a month. Right. It's it's a lot more set it and forget it. It's the Ron it's a little more Ron Popeely, if you will. <laughs> That's right. The what, what was his thing? His thing was the uh the cooker with the yeah, the, 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 the rotisserie. Yeah, the rotisserie, yeah. the grease machine. Yeah, I love that thing. That's funny. Okay, awesome, man. Well, hey, Mark, I really appreciate you being on here today. I think this has been awesome. Is there anything else that people should know that that we maybe didn't cover here that maybe you want to cover as far as VIX, volatility in general, anything that would just like help them out and, and make them yeah, a smarter I, trader? I, one thing we didn't cover is that when you're trading VIX options, you have to be aware that every month has its own underlying. So the underlying for the October contract is the October future. The underlying contract for the November contract is the November future. So whereas in so the pricing of time spreads and, and swaps like that can be very different. It is entirely possible to trade a long call spread for a credit in VIX, and that doesn't mean it's a good trade. So you just have to be aware that that every every contract has its own underlying. Gotcha. That's really and, and actually, and, and this brings up a, a quick question and, and something too. As far as because people like to do, I don't I don't do them, but people like to do calendars on VIX and, and VXX, right? And and so can you just, just pre- different, but VIX. Do not do calendars. Okay. And then quickly, let's talk about why you don't do that. Because people think, okay, calendars, that's a volatility play, rising volatility, but it still gets back to that differential in the contracts. That's different, right. October, the October future is going to be more volatile than the November future. So if you buy a long, if you do a long calendar, what can happen is that October future can blast higher and the November might not keep up with it. And that, that spread is going to act a lot more like a future spread when yeah. you do those calendars than a, uh, an actual time spread. So gotcha. you can actually lose more than the cost of, a, of that calendar, which is very different than any other type of calendar. Right. And creates more danger and obviously more risk. So, okay, good. Hey, so again, we'll have all of the stuff here posted on the show notes page at optionalpha.com slash show 68. That's just the number 68, optionalpha.com slash show 68. So again, Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Where can people find out more about you and what you do and uh, basically get connected with you? Yeah, you just go to optionpit.com. We write a blog every day or you can and go to optionpit.com slash blog, read my blog. We talk volatility and VIX and S&P and some stocks just about every day. And you can follow me on Twitter at optionpit. Gotcha. And we'll be tweeting this out and sending out everything, obviously, when the show goes live. And everyone who's listening here, again, I'll link up to the page that has the uh, ebook from Mark 
on the fear gauge and the VIX and kind of goes through all the stuff. It's a really good read. It's a, it's not a long thing. I think it's like 15, 16 pages, something like that, but a really good read, something you guys should definitely check out. So I will link that up in the show notes page again, Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot. Now, our favorite part of the show, Trader Q&A, where we answer a question, question from one of our current members of Options Trading. Got a question you'd like to answer? Live on air? Just head over to optionalpha.com forward slash ask and hit the record button to leave a message. That's optionalpha.com forward slash ask. Hi, Kirk. My name is Jeremy from Melbourne, Australia. I want to thank you, first of all, for all the great content you're putting out there. It's been really helpful as evidenced by my growing account size since following your strategies. My question is in relation to finding candidates for earnings trades. I know hundreds of companies announce earnings quarterly, and surely you'd have a way of assessing which of these you should or shouldn't be trading. And further to this, how would you decide which strategy to use, i.e. whether to sell a straddle or strangle? Thanks again. All right. So Jeremy, thank you so much for submitting your question into the trader Q&A segment. And thanks for submitting it all the way in from Australia. I know we've got people from 43 different countries around the world who now are part of our community. So it's really good to hear from people outside of the US. So your question was really two parts. One was how do you find or how do you really select the companies that you're going to trade around earnings? And really, this question in its most simplest terms can be basically boiled down to this. Trade the biggest names with the most liquidity, right? That's what you really want to focus on. So often inside of our own forum at Option Alpha for Pro and Elite members, uh, we'll get people who will post in there and say, hey, here are the tickers I'm looking at for today. And I'm like, I've never heard of these companies before in my life. Like, are are these tickers real? Like, I think they're a joke, you know, sometimes. But the reality is you want to trade the biggest names. So the Googles, the Apples, the Microsoft, the Tesla, the Exxons, et cetera. The big, big, big name companies, the ones that you would recognize and everyone else would recognize because they most likely have really, really high liquidity. Now, that doesn't mean that they always have high liquidity or that some, you know, smaller name company, you know, has low liquidity, but you really, really want to focus on the big names. So I would say you could take even like the S&P 500, the S&P 100, you could take the Dow Jones, for example, and take those major indexes. And that would be a very good start of different companies that you can track and uh, scan for. Now, of course, from there, you really want to look at high implied volatility earnings setups first. So those companies where they get into their earnings event and before the earnings announcement, they've got really high implied volatility. I know that right now, at the time that we release this show on, at the end of October, we're right in the middle of earnings season. And some of the big name companies that we typically trade, like a Tesla and an Apple and a Chipotle, just didn't have high implied volatility heading into their earnings event this time around. Not to say that it will always happen like this. It was just this particular quarter or earnings season, they just didn't have really high implied volatility. So we didn't make trades. And all of those stocks end up making you know pretty big moves in either direction. So it worked out in our favor. So that's another key point. Now, the other question that you had was, how do you determine the strategy? Now, for me, the strategy is really determined mostly by implied volatility. So as implied volatility gets higher and higher and higher heading into that earnings event, my strategy that I'm going to deploy is going to get more and more aggressive. And what I mean by that is I will start off with something maybe simple like an iron condor or a wide strangle, right? So let's say implied volatility is in the 50th rank. So just at that 50th rank, maybe I'll start off with a really wide iron condor in that case because implied volatility is high, but it's not insanely high. So I want to give myself room to be wrong. And as implied volatility goes higher and higher and higher and starts going to 70 and 80 and 90 IV rank, then we're going to start getting more aggressive and we'll start doing you know, either the very, very tight straddle, so at the money options or just slightly out of the money options, or we'll do an iron butterfly, which is just the cousin of a straddle. It's the at the money straddle, and then you're buying wings for protection. So it's how people might trade if you have an IRA account or a Roth account, something like that. So even doing this, so trying to get more aggressive as implied volatility goes higher, one thing that you have to keep in mind is you have to be able to get outside of the expected move. So in our course online, as I'm sure you've seen, and if you're new to Option Alpha, we've got a very detailed course, a 33-page guide on how you can trade these earnings events and like step-by-step how you go through it. What you have to understand is that you have to get your break-even points outside of the expected move. And notice I said break-even points. I didn't say strike prices. So if you trade a straddle, which is an at-the-money call and an at-the-money put, If you take in a $5 credit, well, that credit moves your break-even point $5 out on either end. 
and it's taking in enough credit to move your break-even points beyond the expected move because then and only then do you end up trading with a 70% or more chance of success, which is really where we ultimately want to be with some of these one-day events. Now, remember, if you'd like to get your question answered here live on the podcast or very soon on Periscope and Facebook, head on over to optionalpha.com slash ask. It is first come, first serve, and click the big red button in the middle of the screen. There's no software to download or install. It's really easy, and then you can just leave me a private voicemail and say whatever you want to say, whatever your question is, where you're from, what you like about Option Alpha, what you don't, I don't, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's up to you. So before we get into the closing bell segment, I did want to let you guys know about our special podcast freebie today. It is our seven step entry checklist. It is basically the seven things that you need to be checking and going through before you get into a trade. And the beautiful thing about this seven step checklist is that it gets you out of a trade early. So it is written in order so that if you get to step one, then you have to pass step one to get to step two. And at step two, it may not be a good trade, so then you can move on to the next one. And you don't have to go through all seven steps before you make a trade. It's really meant to save you a lot of time and be your quick like chronological order checklist of things you should be looking at. So again, it's completely free. You can get it at optionalpha.com slash seven steps. That's just the number seven, seven steps, or by texting the word seven steps Again, that's just the number seven, S-T-E-P-S, seven steps to the short code 44222. So again, you can text it into seven steps at 44222 and you can get a copy of that free ebook today. Now, the closing bell. Find out which stocks we're looking at right now, trades we're making, and hear our game plan moving forward. Moving forward. All right, so in today's closing bell segment, I actually want to go over a new trade that we just placed recently here in Netflix. Now, Netflix has just recently announced earnings, so this is kind of fitting because we had a question from Jeremy about earnings trades, and Netflix had a huge move after earnings. Now, we did not trade Netflix around earnings this time, and thank God we didn't because it basically moved about 20% after it announced earnings. It was around $100, then moved up to around $118, $119 the very next day. So huge, huge move in Netflix. But since that day, Netflix has also run up another 10%. So we're looking at basically about a 30% move in this stock in let's call it about five days. Now, I don't care who you are. I don't care how great the stock is. I don't care if Netflix's CEO is Steve Jobs' brother. A stock like this that runs up in for 30% in literally five days is going to meet some sort of resistance. Now, if you look at a chart of Netflix and you just look back the year, the last year or so, you'll see that the last recent high that Netflix had was around 132, 133. So we're really pushing like the recent highs, meaning all those people who bought back in you know November and December of last year, they've been waiting for an opportunity to sell and just break even, right? And that's really where this kind of like, you know, resistance level is going to come in. But, you know, I'm the type of trader where I think, you know, a stock like this makes a 30% move in five days. I think that there's going to be a little bit of a pushback in getting anything higher than this, right? So not to say that Netflix couldn't do better and couldn't continue to rally. I think it's just going to be hard to do that beyond this point. So what we're going to end up doing here is we're going to end up selling a vertical call credit spread. So we're going to take the bearish directional side of this trade here for Netflix. We're going to sell the December options, which have got about 53, 54 days to go until expiration right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to do it high probability. So as we always do, we're still going to leave room for Netflix to run higher and still make some money. So right now at the time that we're doing this, Netflix is trading right about 130. We're selling the 145, 150 credit call spread. What that means is that we're selling the 145 calls, buying the 150 calls to give us protection. So we just need Netflix to trade anywhere below 145. So think about it. We're leaving another basically 15% of upside movement in Netflix over the next 50 some days. And only if it does more than that, do we lose on this trade. So we're really like, you know, not only are we just pushing the boundary here and like really forcing Netflix to make an insane move in basically, you know, two months. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't do anything anywhere close to that, then we end up making a little bit of money. And I think if we get a little bit of a drop 
in Netflix, a little bit of profit taking on any level here in the next couple of days. I think that this spread comes in really, really nicely and comes in really, really quickly. So we're selling these for about $65 a piece. We're doing a couple of these right now to kind of scale into it. So like I said, we've got a, a pretty nice profit target on this that we're going to try to buy these back around 30 cents. And so try taking about $30 per spread that we're selling. So we're selling a bunch of sets of these. And hopefully we could make some you know good directional money here in Netflix. Again, I think this is more of like a, a play here after earnings event when you see a stock just continue to run and run and run. Again, you know that markets can't go up forever. They can't go down forever. There's going to be some fluctuations, some reversion to the mean. So that's what we're playing for. So we'll see how this actually ends up playing out over the course of the next month or two. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything. Free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right, now I truly hope you enjoyed today's show. And like I always say, I hope you got at least one thing out of it that you can apply right now to make you a smarter more profitable trader investor. As always, you can get additional resources and links mentioned in the show and some related video training about volatility from today's show by going to optionalpha.com slash show 68. That's just the number 68, optionalpha.com slash show 68. And until next time, happy trading.